Alright, you all can hear me. Can you all hear me? Is this good? Does this work? Okay. Welcome to the Houston Maritime Museum. Good evening. Um, I'm Leslie Bowen and I'm the director of the museum and uh, very excited to see you all here tonight. Another almost standing room in the crowd, so we're getting there. Um, and good news is we are finally building a new building, so there'll be more room for all of you and all of your friends. Um, when you walk out tonight, look and see. We've got a new rendering of what our new building will look like uh, by the front door, which is very exciting. Um, and we have all kinds of interesting things happening, so it's just we'll keep you posted. Uh, we are going and blowing. We're, we're designing, building, signing, doing all sorts of things. And we're going to be raising money soon, too. Um, so as you know, let's see, we have the, the standard things that we have to do uh, for these lectures. If you all don't mind signing your name and how you heard about the, the event, uh, that will be very helpful to us. We have, as you know, how we say uh, keep the door open is through memberships and sponsorships. We have some information here. If you're not already a member, we would love for you to become one. Um, we have, um, one of, as you know, that history lectures, monthly history lectures. We also have, uh, in April, we're going to have a special presentation, April 24th, uh, which will be one of our industry lectures. We did a couple last year, um, and the industry lecture, this, this first one in the series, will be the salvage operation of the Costa Concordia. So that should be a lot of fun and very interesting. Uh, so mark your calendars for April 28th. And you'll probably get a couple of notices from us just in case. So, um, so that I don't delay, I would like very much to, uh, I'm very excited about presenting our guests tonight are going to talk about the purging of the seas, the government reaction to piracy uh, from 1600 till today. And obviously pirates used to be those really cool guys with a leg and maybe a fake arm and an eye patch and now they carry AK-47. Um, a little bit different, uh, but so we'll, we're going to make that journey, I think, tonight. So Dr. Kim Todd and Dr. Elizabeth Lyman uh, are here this evening. Um, um, Dr. Todd is with the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, um, and she focuses on the history of early America. So we'll get a lot of interesting, really cool uh, information, I think, there. And Dr. Nyman is uh, also at the University of Louisiana. And um, political science is your director. So here we go. I'm going to introduce you to our speakers tonight, and thank you for being here. Thank you, everybody. It's it's really a pleasure to be here this uh -oh. evening. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I've been driving for four hours. <laughs> I have not had dinner yet. Uh, no, no. So uh, thank you very much, Leslie, and, and all of you here at the Houston Maritime Museum. It's an honor to be here this evening. Um, I tell you a little bit, this is a story that I always tell my graduate students, and I know there are some undergraduates and graduate students here in the audience. Liz and I uh, started at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette uh, three years ago. I had finished my PhD at Cornell and after a career in business in aviation, and then made the smart move to go to maritime, of course, um, and we sat next to each other and said, hi, hi, how are you? What do you do? Oh, I do this. Oh, what do you do? I do this. And when we mentioned the word piracy, our eyebrows sort of raised each other and said, oh my goodness, well, I'm a historian and you're the current person. And since that time, we meet weekly for Pull Boys and talk about <laughs> piracy and what we're doing. So we're working on the textbook together, which we're really excited about. I think it's going to be kind of a unique theme for the classroom. And we talk about uh, doing lectures like this, and so we're, we're here tonight for you, and all sorts of other activities that we're trying to sort of use our unique skills. I think it's very different when you have an interdisciplinary discussion with a historian and a political scientist. We come from very different training and very different perspectives as we look at piracy. So um, let me get started. Okay. There we go. Okay. So one of the things that I deal with all the time, I'm a walker by the way, so I'm going to walk in front of things. Um, one of the things that I deal with in early American history is of course this wonderful place called the Atlantic World. 
And it's a really special place for us as historians. It's a paradigm, it's a model that was established about 30 to 35 years ago about how we address everything. So rather than just looking at individual colonies or rather than just looking at individual nations or maybe even the relationship between nations, we start to see this whole area as something that's very special. People interact with it in, in very unique ways and they use water as that means of transportation. So you have Europe, of course, and Africa, and South America, the Caribbean, and North America, and it's a very lucrative place. Why? Because I'm sure all of you, once upon a time, learned about the infamous triangle, right? The triangle trade between Europe and Africa, and then coming over to the Caribbean or to North America. Most of that involved the slave trade. Yes, it did. But as historians, as new, newer historians, we're not dismissing the triangle trade, but we're saying that there are other trades involved as well, not just with respect to slavery. So of course, if you are so inclined and want to perhaps make a little money on the side, i.e. take it from somebody else, you're gonna look at the Atlantic because it's a really rich area. It's probably smart if I go this So, well, one of the things there are always outlaws in every society. And let's face it, that's what pirates are, okay? They're outlaws. But one of the things that governments did very early on, beginning in about the 14th, 15th century, is that they said, we know these people exist. We're gonna use them to our advantage. So we're gonna give them letters of mark or privateering commissions. We're gonna legalize their activities under our laws. <clears throat> so I'm gonna use England as an example. So say I'm the King of England, or in this case, the Queen of England, and I say I want my privateers to go out and attack France, boo, you know, nasty French, and boo the Spanish, and we're gonna attack them. And because they're Catholic nations and they're our traditional enemy if we live in England. So I'm gonna give my privateers one of these commissions, a letter of mark. And they're going to be able to wave it in the faces of anybody and say, well, Queen Kim has said that I can go and attack you, France, or Spain. But it's very specific, okay? It's not a carte blanche that they can attack everybody. So they have my permission. Now, why do I want to do that? Well, it's pretty easy. It's inexpensive. That's number one, right? I don't have to pay anything for this privateer to go out and attack France and Spain. That's pretty good from my perspective. I also get some benefit because I say to that privateer, thank you very much, you're gonna give me 10% or 20%, whatever it is that we discuss, that he's gonna return to me, whether it be jewels or coin, whatever, okay? So from my perspective, I can give out a lot of these letters of marks or privateering commissions, and I have my own little private navy out there doing what they want to do for me, for my benefit. That means I don't necessarily have to <coughs> subsidize or put in place a navy itself. And that means I don't have to hire sailors, I don't have to um, outfit ships, I don't have to build ships. So this is pretty fortunate for me. So privateering is a great thing for royalty particularly beginning in the 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, 18th century as well. It's inexpensive and lucrative for all involved, except if you're the ship that's been captured, of course. <coughs> so that's problematic. Okay, so this privateering commission, whoops, sorry about that. This privateering commission was actually given by William III, you can see William III up here, to Captain Kidd, the infamous Captain Kidd. Well, some of us, if you're interested in talking about Captain Kidd afterwards, I'm happy to talk about Captain Kidd. Great book, if you ever want to read one. Robert Ritchie wrote a wonderful biography of Captain Kidd. Captain Kidd kind of got a raw deal. Um, we believe that as historians. So here's Charles II, and he's signing the Hudson Bay Charter. And Charles is right here. And this allows for privateering. Now, what are charters? their agreements. The crown is giving up something to an individual or a group of individuals. And charters are the precursors 
to companies, particularly for uh, England, but also for the Dutch and for the French and for the Spanish. So for instance, if all of you had a little bit of money to spare and you wanted to purchase shares in the Hudson Bay Charter or whatever charter it may have been, or the company, you would have said, well, thank you. I'm willing to hand over some money to be part of this company. And I will reap the benefits, right? Many of you own shares of stock today. This is exactly what was happening here. But this is the precursor to what you know today. Part of this is that the companies or charters allowed for privateering. And again, all of that is going to go back to number one, the company, but also the crown as well. So if you look at charter agreements in place that start to be established, particularly for the new world in the 17th and the 18th centuries, you will see paragraphs that allow for privateering to occur. Okay? So again, this is all state sanctioned, capital S, state, <coughs> government sanctioned piracy. They want it because it's beneficial. Well, here we go. Privateers are well armed. They have wonderful ships. They have a lot of cannons. They have their letter of mark that they can flail around. And they're in search of specific ships. Remember, they're only allowed to attack a particular nation or nation's ships. So again, speaking about England here, I'm going to allow my privateers to go attack France and Spain, whatever it may be at the particular time. So wonderful image here of a privateer flying the flag here of England and attacking enemy ships. Perfectly legal. I've encouraged that as queen. I want them to go and do this. Blackbeard. Well, Blackbeard, you know, he started out as a pretty decent guy. And then something happened along the way. He got a little angry about things. So he decides that he is going to become a pirate. He's gone from privateer to pirating. And he's a very good pirate. Now, he no longer has my permission to do what he's doing. So he's now illegal. And I will send my Royal Navy out to get him because now he's disrupting not only French and Spanish trade, for instance, which I get, had given him permission to do so, but now he's attacking my ships, and I don't like that. That's not allowed. So I'm going to send out my Royal Navy. This is going to cost me money, but he's really, you know, costing me money in a lot of ways. So here's a pirate attack. Very different, right, than a privateering attack. Privateering, legalized piracy. Piracy is illegal under anybody's book. So pirate attacks tended to occur solo ship, right? Ships were traveling in convoys for safety purposes, obviously, in this time period. But storms, events happen where ships are outside of their convoy. And what happens? Pirates are waiting for them. And this quite often happens in near pirate havens. Now, all of you, I teach piracy uh, at UL. And I have students that sells out right away. You know, they all think we're going to learn about Johnny Depp and we're going to watch all the Pirates of the Caribbean films, you know. And they come in and they're all excited and I burst their bubble right away, okay. But they understand that. By the end, they understand a lot about piracy. But one of the things they learn about, and Liz and I, this is something that we love to talk about, the comparisons and the similarities between 400 years of piracy is that pirate havens existed. The Caribbean is one place. <coughs> Anybody ever hear of Port Royal in Jamaica? Mm -hmm. Few people, right? What happened to Port Royal? Well, it well it disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sixteen ninety-two. Yeah. An earthquake comes, right, and the whole area disappears. Some wonderful archaeology doing that, maritime archaeology going up now. If you're interested, there are some websites you can see what's happening. They're trying to figure out where all the warehouses were and the merchant houses and that sort of thing, so it's kind of cool. But these pirate havens existed to support pirates. So the whole communities were there to support and receive the proceeds from pirates. And these exist all around the world, not just in North America or the Caribbean, but in China, in Indonesia, in Africa, these pirate havens existed. So 
This pirate ship is not going to stray very far from its haven. He wants to be able to attack a lone ship. He wants to be able to come back to its haven, distribute the goods from its crew, but also within the community itself. So this is very important. So this changes the makeup. Remember, privateering, legalized piracy, I'm going to bring my goods back, I'm going to bring my spoils back to the monarch who has supported me. Piracy, no. The havens are there for the existence of pirates. Well, Captain Kidd, Kid, unfortunately, suffers the ultimate fate for a pirate, right? He's hung because he's a treason to the crown. He's gone outside his letter of mark. He was a privateer. He did exist with the permission of the monarch to do what he was meant to do, to attack ships. But then he's accused of going outside <coughs> his letter of mark. And as a monarch, I can't allow that. I have to shut that down right away because that's against my authority as a monarch. So this is what happens to Kidd. He is hung in London. And remember, he had done his own work around the New York area subsequent to the Dutch leaving. So he's in colonial New York in the late 17th century, early 18th century. But he's brought over to London to face trial. His wife is even arrested as well. Um, and this is his fate. And so he starves to death. He's hung over the Thames, and he's hung in this sort of contraption, as you can see, so that all the sailors sailing by will have seen his body. And they will send the message out, remember, because the waterway, the oceans are wonderful networks of information, and they will send out the information that they had seen Kid hang and starving to death. And so his skeleton would be in there for months, if not years, afterwards, uh, as the flesh and muscle and all the innards are sort of eaten away by crows and whatnot. This was a very powerful message that the Crown sent to the general public, but particularly the seafaring public. If you think you're going to get away with something, I'm not going to let you. My authority is greater than yours. And of course, Blackbeard, uh, the infamous pirate Blackbeard, uh, is in a battle with the Royal Navy. So he is a pirate. As a monarch, I cannot allow. He's too successful as a pirate. I've got to take him down. I've got to devote resources. I've got to set ships from the Royal Navy to go seek him. And I do so as a monarch. And eventually, there's a battle. Blackbeard is killed. And again, we want to make sure that everybody sees it. So his head is hung from a Royal Navy ship, and that ship, wherever it goes, and then particularly back to London, everybody will see Blackbeard's head hanging there. Blackbeard was uh, also kind of notorious for his beard, uh, in which he had candles hanging. So you can only imagine the fire hazard associated. He was a bit crazy, too. So, um, but, but everybody knew who Blackbeard was. So, all right. Oh. I'm always jealous she gets to talk about Blackbeard. I mean, like, I get to talk about all the modern pirates and, and they're fun, but Blackbeard, you know? So I'm gonna bring the story into the present. After the time of Blackbeard, we start seeing a decline in piracy, in part because countries are doing, like Kim said, they're starting to attack these pirates. They wanna send the appropriate message. Piracy really goes into decline. It never goes away. There's, a, there's always outlaws. It never goes away. But you start seeing this big decline. By the beginning of the 20th century, a lot of people in what we call the West, so Europe, America, they started thinking that hey, piracy's kind of dead. Like, we don't really have pirates anymore. Not like we used to. Not with Blackbeard and Captain Morgan and all of that stuff. Piracy's kind of dead. And so we thought this, we, we, we actually used it as a case study in like, how can we draft international law back in like the 20s when people were starting to think maybe we need some like laws because you know, World War I was kind of a bad idea. Maybe we should do some stuff to work together. And I'm like, you know, we need something though that, that like really is kind of a safe thing. I know, let's talk about piracy. Piracy's dead, no one cares. And we did the same thing when we made maritime law in the 1950s. Nobody really thought about piracy because piracy was dead for the most part. Again, in the 70s and the 80s, when we're negotiating the law of the sea, eh, piracy's kind of dead. Well, around 2000, piracy starts not looking quite so dead anymore. 
First, we see a rise of piracy in Southeast Asia. Then we see a rise of piracy off the coast of Somalia, like my friend over here. And today we're seeing a rise in piracy off the, of the Gulf of Guinea, off Nigeria. So we're seeing pirates rise again. Because of time constraints, we're not going to talk about all those. We're going to focus on our Somali friends, because we got an interesting story about these guys. So everyone's heard of the pirates of Somalia, right? They, oh yeah. You know, you've seen the movie Captain Phillips. They attacked the Bearsk, Alabama, and took him hostage. And then the Navy SEALs came in and shot all the pirates except one. So. Talk a little bit about the rise of piracy in Somalia. What you see going on here is basically piracy occurs for a couple of different reasons off the coast of Somalia. First and simplest, because it can. Somalia has got two beautiful coasts off the Horn of Africa. You can go up to the Gulf of Aden. You can go over to the Indian Ocean. You have lots of traffic going through the Arabian Sea. Lots of opportunity. and. The other thing that you have going on is in 1991 there was a coup that takes out the leader of Somalia and uh, Black Hawk Down, all of that stuff, kind of plunged Somalia into chaos. There was no one in charge because they all agreed they didn't want the dictator in charge, but then once they got the dictator out, they started fighting in and amongst themselves over who would take over. So you have these different warlords that kind of carved out their own areas. So there's no one in charge. There's no Somali Navy. There's no Somali Coast Guard. There's no one to stop people from engaging in piracy. If they want to go out, take a ship, bring it back, beach it until they can negotiate a ransom, there's no government to stop them from doing it. They absolutely can. The other thing that leads a lot of Somalis to take up piracy, and this is, this is the pirate's version of the story, so take it with a grain of salt. But because there's no Navy, because there's no Coast Guard, a lot of these guys allege that people were doing lots of really illegal bad stuff in their waters. Because we have rules about who, where you can go fishing and how much fish you can catch. If you've ever tried to catch a fish on the ocean, you know all about that stuff. But if there's no one to enforce the law off the coast of Somalia, there's nothing that keeps the Spanish, the Taiwanese, the Japanese from coming in and doing whatever they want to. And so a lot of these guys are alleging, you know, look, I used to fish. I used to be an honest fisherman. And then those foreigners came in, and they took all our fish, and I couldn't make any money fishing. And so, you know, I'm going to stick it to them. I'm going to show them that, you know what, they can't do that. If they're going to come in my waters, I'm going to get them. And so there's a little bit of that going on as well. Like I said, that's the pirate's version of the story. In fact, one of the, uh, there's like about five different pirate gangs at the height of Somali Coast Guard. One of them named themselves the Somali Coast Guard. As like, this is their version of what they're doing here. So you have all this stuff going on. And for a while there, around about 2008 or so on, all you heard in the news were these guys. They're attacking and they're attacking and they're taking all these ships and they're getting millions of dollars in ransom. We don't know exactly how much they would pull in for ransom because surprisingly companies don't want to talk about that. I can't imagine why. But the few ones that we do know about were pretty hefty. We're talking about millions of dollars in ransoms in some cases. And why not? These guys are attacking oil tankers. They're attacking these big private yachts. They're attacking container ships. They're attacking all sorts of different things. In fact, there's usually about three instances we think that they took UN World Food Program ships. The UN does not like to talk about this because the UN does not want to admit it paid ransom for them. But they're, they're like attacking and attacking and attacking and attacking. So this is from 2011. The yellow dots represent attempted attacks. The orange dots represent uh, actual successful attacks. The purple dots, there's not very many of them, but there's a few, are suspicious vessels sighted but didn't get a chance to attack or not. So you can see, these guys are everywhere. This is from 2011. At their maximum, we're looking at about 2 million square miles of ocean that these guys are patrolling, potentially taking hostages, bringing them back, usually to this part of Somalia, the part known as Puntland, and keeping them there for months, years even sometimes, until the ransom can be negotiated and paid. So everyone was like really nervous about these pirates. This is the map from 2014. Notice the difference? It's almost entirely gone. All of those attacks, almost entirely gone. You still have some attempts. You have lots of those suspicious vessels. They're still out there. Pirates haven't gone away. 
but they're not nearly as successful as they were before. Well, clearly something happened. <laughs> so there's a bunch of different things that went on to bring us from this to this. I'm going to talk about all of them because it took a lot of different attacks on a lot of different fronts to really try and eliminate the piracy threat. 2014, I mean, the jury's still out, but I can tell you this. We haven't had a single Somali pirate attack this year yet. It's only March. You know, can't guarantee it's going to hold. But it's, we've seen a precipitous decline. What happened? Well, first of all, one thing that happened is the ship started getting wise. If you're sailing through these waters, you know these guys are out there. And so you start taking precautions that maybe you didn't take in 2005 or you didn't take in 2008. You start traveling in convoys, just like they did in the past. You start maintaining 24-hour watch. You start making sure that you never stop when you're traveling through these waters. Uh, you start using hoses. You put hoses off the sides of your ships so that if someone came up these pirates are in pretty small, quick vessels. They'd have to use ladders to get up to the deck of your ship. But if you've got these powerful water cannons, you can kind of like hose them down and keep them from getting up onto your ship. So you have all of that stuff going on. You also have, however, some other stuff going on that governments are doing to try and eliminate the piracy threat. Because it's kind of an important area of the world. A lot of, lot of maritime traffic goes through these straits. I mean, it's the Persian Gulf up there. This is an important <coughs> maritime region. And so Somalia doesn't have a government that, it can, that can come in and take care of the problem in Somalia. But that doesn't mean the rest of the world's governments aren't interested, because everyone wants to make sure that sweet, sweet oil keeps flowing, right? Everyone wants to make sure that this traffic continues to go. <coughs> go America. So one of the things that, uh, that governments did was they came together in these coalitions that they would work together to eliminate the piracy threat. So this is a picture of America, of Americans who were uh, involved in anti-piracy efforts in 2009. So this is a bit of an old picture. But basically, back in 2001, you guys might remember September 11th, we invaded Afghanistan, little things, might jog your memory. We had something called Combined Task Force 150, which was a coalition of nations whose job it was to prevent terrorism and maritime terrorism at sea. So they were supporting Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan and making sure that our ships were safe from terrorists. Now it's 2001. By 2005, 2006, 2007, people start going, you know, what's really a threat are these pirates. I mean, they're terrorists and they attack at sea, and that's important. But now we're starting to see a lot of this piracy stuff, and that's not really our job. We're supposed to be watching for terrorists. We're not supposed to be watching for pirates. And so in 2009, when this picture was taken, we spun off Combined Task Force 151, aren't we clever? Which is led by the Americans. It's based out of the, um, Bahrain, headquarters of the Fifth Fleet, coalition of 30 different countries whose job it is basically is to volunteer ships, crews, men to go out and patrol the area for piracy. Now, this isn't cheap by any means because you're talking about various governments. The Americans are sending out ships, as you see here. Um, some European countries are involved, Germany, some of the, uh, the Asian countries are involved, South Korea, things like that. They're all working together and supporting this, and they're donating ships to the effort. Now, again, when we're talking about maritime security, people tend to be a little close-lipped about exactly where they are and exactly how much they're spending and exactly where these ships are and how well armed they are. But Combined Task Force 151 had anywhere from about mm, five, at the low end two, at the high end five to ten ships in Somali pirate waters at any given time. The high end back at that beautiful map you saw earlier when there's lots of attacks, today it's more like two ships that they keep out there. And this is a huge cost to the coalition. It's about five million in administrative costs alone in 2013. Just based on the administrative base at the, at the Fifth Fleet. Because you have the Americans who are in charge, but you also have all these officials from all these different countries who are also involved in the effort, and paying them takes money. So, and then that's not even counting 
fuel costs, the cost of paying all these soldiers, all this, that, and the other. So it's a very expensive proposition. <coughs> Coalition Task Force 151 isn't the only people out there. The European Union sent out their own. Because this is the European Union, everything the European Union ever does is called the European Union something or another. So this is the European Union Naval Force in Somalia, Operation Atalanta. And the Europeans send out, again, about five to 10 ships as part of what they call EU now for Somalia or Operation Atalanta. You can see he's got a little patch here that shows Somalia. It says EU now for, but you can't really read it. And they would, they would send all these ships out. They actually are a bigger uh, proportion right now out there than the, than the Combined Task Force 151. They have more like five to 10 ships out there now. They pay the according costs. They cost them about 10 million in administrative fees, plus again, all the soldiers, all the ships, all the fuel, all that stuff. But they've been a very big presence. They've also tried to work with Somalia. And this was pretty difficult. We were talking 2009, 2010, where the government's in exile in Kenya, and there's no one really in charge of what's going on within the borders of Somalia itself. They're trying to work with the Somalis on land to try and get things going, and they're trying to work with them at sea to make sure that nobody's getting past them. And the last of the big coalitions is also the smallest, but NATO had some ships out there as well, usually one to two ships as part of what they called Operation Ocean Shield. I love these names, they're amazing. Operation Ocean Shield. Again, about five million in administrative costs plus everything else. And that was 2013, these are 2013 numbers. So at the very least, 20 million in administrative costs from the coalitions alone, somewhere around probably 10 ships altogether at any given time. In addition to all of this stuff, you also have individual navies sending out ships. So the Chinese Navy had a couple of ships out there patrolling Somali waters to protect Chinese vessels. Indian Navy had a ship or two out there protecting that. So then you have another about 10 or so of those. Again, most of these countries very tight-lipped on where their ships are at any given moment in terms of public knowledge, but they're out there too. So we got 20 ships protecting 2 million square, square miles of ocean. Huh. That sounds like an easy job. There's a lot of curiosity about what exactly the role of these coalition forces have played in terms of driving down piracy. Because on the one hand, they're effective. There have been a few, and these were pretty, pretty amusing times, there have been a few times where the uh, Somali pirates got what I can only say is very confused and accidentally attacked a coalition ship. I feel really bad for the ones that attacked a naval vessel off, a US naval vessel off the Seychelles. Like really, guys, I picked on the wrong guy that time. But it seems, to be, it seems to be fair to say that the Somali pirates knew these guys were out there and they tried to change their tactics accordingly. They would try to keep track of where the coalition ships were. They would, if they saw them coming, they would leave. They would you know, get rid of, they would throw their weapons off the, off the sides of the ships. So a Royal Naval vessel from Britain, for example, would stop them. They'd throw the AK-47s and the rocket launchers off the sides of the ship, and they'd be like, we're just fishermen. And they'd be like, where's your fishing equipment? We lost it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh, sure you did. But you know, they had to throw their stuff, they had to throw the GPSs, they had to throw all that stuff off, off the sides. Royal Navy couldn't hold them because they couldn't prove they were pirates. And they'd have to go back to Somalia and it would cost them money. Every time that they got stopped or they had to flee, it cost them money. It was becoming more expensive and more difficult. You also found that they would change their tactics. They would go to different areas to try to avoid the coalition ships. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Um, arguably, that was one of the causes that led to the hijacking of the Marisk, Alabama, Captain Phillips' ship was that they were trying to avoid the coalition forces and so they weren't kind of expected to be there. Uh, some of Captain Phillips' testimony is questioned by his crew, but that's one version of the story is that they didn't expect there to be pirates there because that wasn't a pirate lane. The pirates were kind of driven there because they were trying to avoid these guys. So we see that the pirates are changing their behavior and doing all of that stuff. But probably one of the bigger things that impacted the decline of Somali piracy actually had nothing to do with piracy at all. These are the African Union forces in Somalia. 
And around 2005, something started happening in Somalia that got a lot of people's attention that didn't have anything to do with the water. There was the rise of an Islamic group called the Islamic Courts Union in Somalia, about, like I said, the middle of the first decade of the 2000s. And people started getting a little nervous about these guys. What, are they, what is this Islamic group doing? Are they going to be extremists? Do they support Al-Qaeda? Do we really want an Islamic group running Somalia? Is this, a, is this a good thing? So the African Union, a group of countries in Africa, organized what was called ANISOM, the African Union Mission in Somalia. And their goal was to drive out the Islamic Courts Union, which is extinct, so they succeeded in that regard. Unfortunately for them, the Islamic Courts Union was put, replaced by a different, more extreme Islamic group known as Al-Shabaab. You guys heard of Al-Shabaab? They're the ones that attacked uh, Ugandan parties at the World Cup in 2010. They were behind the Nairobi shopping uh, mall attack and most recently threatened the Mall of America <coughs> earlier this year. Al-Shabaab, they're one of the, we want to turn back the clock to the 6th century, follow the Quran, complete straight up. Ironically, they really hate pirates. That, that's not Quranic at all. Um, but nobody wanted to see these guys in charge. And so, when they started taking over, the African Union mission in Somalia got a little more serious because these guys were not only potentially bigger problems than the Islamic Court Union, they had proven they weren't limiting themselves to Somalia. They're attacking Uganda, they're attacking Kenya, they're attacking all these countries in Africa. And so these guys get together and they say, you know, we need to take care of these. So 2013-2014, Amazon really takes off in Somalia. And they start pushing back Al-Shabaab. Al-Shabaab is on the run, relatively speaking. They take back a lot of Somalia. They take back Mogadishu. And they start allowing that legitimate Somali government to move in. And so now you're starting to see real governance. So at the same time that the pirates are running away at sea from guys like this, they're running away on land from these guys and the Somali government. So it's not safe anymore to just go in and park your ship and leave it for a year or two while you're trying to negotiate with different groups on how you're gonna ransom the crew, how you're gonna ransom a ship. It's harder to get those ships and it's harder to keep them for the length of time that you need to get your ransoms. So over time we start seeing we have this precipitous drop because they're being chased at sea, they're being chased on land, nobody likes these Somali pirates, they're gonna have to go. And it's been successful. Will it stay successful? Well, I don't know, I can't predict the future. But that's kind of where we're at at this point in time. We've got these, these pirates, and they're on the run. It's basically the same story, in a lot of ways, as to the story that she's telling you. These pirate havens, once the pirate havens were no longer safe, you started to see a decline in piracy, it becomes more dangerous, people are losing their lives, all of that sort of thing. It's the exact same story in Somalia as it was in the Atlantic world hundreds of years before. And that's one of the things that we found really interesting. Pirate tactics haven't changed that much. Their weapons have changed, their targets have changed, but who they are and what they want and the best ways to find them are pretty much the same now as they ever were. It's more expensive in some ways, but the payoff is greater in some ways too. The risks and the rewards are there. And so we've seen a lot of this stuff kind of repeat itself over time. Basically, we got the exact same story now as we did before. All right, that's our talk. <laughs> you guys take questions? Absolutely. All right. I'm sure there are a lot of questions, so we've got some experts here. How about it? Oh. Yes. Uh, you know, Somalia you said there were like five pirate groups. And did any group actually specialize in eating? having fishing boats because you're fishing in our water. I don't think there's much money to fishing boats. Uh, not so much. Now, fishing boats were taken for a different reason. Fishing boats, especially the larger ones, were used as motherships. So these guys in the little boats would go out and take a bigger fishing vessel, and then they'd take that over, and then it would look really nice and innocent out there because it really was a fishing boat. And so these tankers would think, oh, it's just a fisherman. And they'd go near it, and they'd be wrong, because then the pirates would spill out of the fishing boat, and then they'd take it over. So fishing boats were valuable for a different reason. Not necessarily for the money, but <laughs> for this nice little guise of innocence. Mm -hmm. Why weren't the um, car container ships and oil ship or, or, um, tanker ships is there some kind of maritime law? There's a couple of different reasons for this. One of the biggest reasons actually has to do with the insurance industry. Yeah. 
Uh, nobody really thinks that oil tankers plus guns is a great idea in terms of safety. Uh, so there was a lot of controversy there. But more of, uh, also to the point was that in some individual countries it was illegal. So if you were on a Danish ship, it might not be legal for Danish ships to be armed. And right around the heyday, around 2011, 2012, a lot of countries, Denmark being one of them, repealed those laws for that reason, but the insurance costs still stopped a lot of people from doing it. What you did see some more of were the rise of independent contractors, um, mercenary ships that would go out and protect these guys. Uh, they're kind of shadowy figures. We don't know a lot about them, but they certainly exist, and th these companies would pay these guys to protect them, either by stationing them on the vessel or by station, like having them hire a vessel to escort them. Mm -hmm. um, you say that the piracy went down in the 1800s, but well, we had some brothers in Louisiana <laughs> that I don't know why you didn't mention them, but they were raising hell in the coast of in the Caribbean coast of Colombia, and they were not only the brothers but also Aoi, and they were based near you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Are you referring to the Lafitte's? Yes. Yeah, so we, uh, as historians, um, I think there's a, a general myth that the Lafitte's were pirates. They were more properly termed smugglers um, because of what of their activity. So while they were quite active with sort of the New Orleans, Galveston area, sort of that way in the bayous associated with them, they are really smuggling at that point as okay. opposed to proper piracy. Sure. Um, they were flying, uh, in Galveston you had the uh, flag of Cartagena flying, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it was the Lafitte that they had a, a letter of mark from the government of Cartagena, so I, I think that they were still privateers bordering pirates because they were going after Spanish vessels in the Caribbean. Right, so again, time and place matter, right? So if you're talking about New Orleans, they're smugglers because that is exactly what they're doing. They're supplying the Bayou area, the Bayou Tesh, um, and out through New Orleans, this, the materials that are needed. So they're smuggling materials up there against the governments of the day. But if you come over to Galveston, again, time and place matter with the government that is in place in Texas at the time, which is Spanish, then they're attacking other ships based on those letters of mark. So they can they can switch sides quite easily. I'm never very friendly with the English. And I think that's where the letters of mark are attacking the English ships. During the American Revolution. <laughs> we know where the question's going. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the letters of mark, they have come from the individual colonies, from the, the, the government or where, where? They're coming from the Continental Congress. And I, in fact, it's a great, great question because I just showed one of my classes um, a letter of mark issued by Benjamin Franklin. So Hancock is issuing these, anybody who's sort of president of the Congress at the time period, and, and Franklin does step in occasionally to act as president, um, they're able to issue these marks. There was no American Navy at that point. In time. No, there isn't. There isn't a Navy until really John Adams starts to fund the Navy as president. Late 1700s when the frigates were. Exactly. That's right. Yes. Uh, when you talked about the Hudson Bay Charter, yeah. they had a paragraph in there about letters of mark. Would that mean that the Hudson Bay Company could issue letters of mark? Both the Hudson Bay. Right. Without going to the Crown for approval. Exactly. So if there were pirates or there was something going on around the Hudson Bay, of course we're talking Canada here in that vast expanse of land, the Governor General of the Hudson Bay Company could issue that letter of mark, or the Crown could issue one from England. Um, so in this period, the Crown has wisened up from their experiences, of course, in what was happening a little bit south and that they're making sure they retain the charter for instance and, and having a little bit more control of who they're they're putting in place. Could a letter of mark be issued for land forces as opposed to naval forces? I don't think so. I think it was always a, a naval on the water uh, situation. Um, if you're talking about land forces then those are mercenaries and I think that's more of a contractual relationship I think between the, I think the Romans. Yeah. And the Lex Gabinia allowed Pompey the Great to not only attack pirates in the Mediterranean, <laughs> sorry, 
classic studies minor. <laughs> um, the Lex Gavinia was issued by the Roman Senate in response to piracy that grew up in the Mediterranean, especially in the East Mediterranean, following the decline of Greece, but before Rome became imperial, so like the late days of the Roman Republic. Uh, and Pompey the Great was given uh, huge authority to eliminate Mediterranean piracy by not just attacking anyone that he wanted to on the water, but I think it was up to 50 miles inland. Yeah. So you did have some of that, but that's ancient times. I don't think of anything in the European tradition. Yeah. Any attacks on cruise ships? Cruise ships tend to avoid those waters, or did. Um, there was a couple of times, I think, where uh, one or two got fired on. And they were, these are the smaller, more luxury liners, not like you know the oasis of the seas or any of these like monstrosities that support 10,000s of people. But some of the richer ones that would take people from, say, Dubai to Singapore, uh, a couple of those have gotten fired at, but they didn't take any. They took a couple of very nice yachts, but I don't think they took any cruise ships. Yeah, why why the, so do you think there's such a public uh, acceptance and f f good f feeling? towards piracy, and how far back did that feeling go, do you think? Uh, because, I mean, I know Gilbert and Sullivan used pirates very very pleasantly in their thing, and that wasn't that much, there were still probably lots of piracy going on uh, in the 1800s, no? I'll let Kim give her opinion, but I'm going to give mine first. Okay. Disney. <laughs> and, and, not, and not Johnny Depp Disney, but uh, they did a Treasure Island movie in, I think it was the 50s. And basically every stereotype you think you know about pirates came from Disney's Treasure Island from the 50s. The stupid accent, the parrot, a lot of that stuff came from, from Disney movies back in the 50s. But. So I'm going to go back a little earlier. I'm going to go back to Daniel Defoe and where he interviews pirates in prison. And this becomes sensationalized and so the, the public in the 18th century is looking forward to the next installment. Of the, of the pirate who's in prison and repenting his sins or not. Um, and, and this is uh, something that's important for us as historians because we have all these, I put this in air quotes, confessions, um, whether they are or not, we're uncertain. Uh, but Defoe, being the good um, person who spin propaganda as he was occasioned, but very good penmanship and author as well, he is, he's putting these out there for public consumption. And so I think we, we start to have that, you know, we have Robert Louis Stevenson who does pen Treasure Island. He, we know that he's read these from Daniel Defoe. So there's a, a history of the- in the When was Defoe? I don't know. I don't who, know. Who was Daniel Defoe? When? When was when Oh, Daniel Defoe was in the 18th century. Robinson Crusoe. Yeah, Robinson Crusoe, yeah, Robinson mm -hmm. Crusoe exactly. Yeah. Ah, okay. Um, so this idea of, you know, being lost and, and that sort of thing. But those uh, who are starting to write in the 19th century about piracy, sort of the boys' own stories, mm -hmm. uh, like Treasure Island, are looking to Defoe for their original sources. <coughs> yes? So uh, I'm glad you, you brought up Roman pirates, but I wanted to ask you sort of on <coughs> in terms of solving two problems at the same time. So is there an opportunity for the European Union to use a lot of Greeks that are out of work <laughs> I like that idea. <laughs> the, yeah, the, the problem is, is that it, the way that these things have tend to work in these coalitions is whoever sends the ship pays. So the government of Greece would be responsible for paying the salary of all of these Greeks. And well, they're a little cash strapped at the moment. Uh, now, if it's like Germany were to step up and agree to pay these guys, I, I think that would be a win-win. But you have to convince Angle America of that, and I bet that's a hard sell. <laughs> and, and don't forget, this is skilled labor. Yes. Oh yeah. So beware of Greeks bearing ships. <laughs> <laughs> They're still great, where, you know. They're still great maritime wayfarers today. It, it's not a terrible idea, but uh, but yeah, I don't I don't see how they're gonna find the money unless someone gives it to them. And gosh darn it, Germany is like holding the purse strings tight these days. <clears throat> All right, we have any more questions? How about Asian pirates? We hear about Atlantic pirates because we're a Eurocentric yes. country full of 
lots of piracy yeah. in the South China Sea and so on. Huge amount of piracy in the South China Sea. In fact, um, when we start looking at women as pirates, and women were pirates, um, one of the most famous ones was a woman who inherits sort of the pirate ships from her husband and becomes even more notorious in her own right and takes on a younger lover who's sort of her mercenary um, and has thousands in her employ and many, many ships as well. So she's quite well known in, I think it's the 17th or 18th century, um, with respect to her own piracy. But it's endemic and it continues today. Where were the big pirate havens in that area? Well, think about all the islands around uh, Indonesia, all the outer islands of China. So those are the havens for them. That's so on the coast themselves of China. So what um, was this woman's name? I, you know, I'm trying to think. I want to believe, I think it's Madam Wong. Chang. W, pardon me? Madam Chang. Madam Chang, C-H-A-I-N-G. Yes, so it's Wang Chang, I believe, is her name. And she's not very, um, she's written about, um, but not as prolifically as, say, some of our Irish uh, women who become pregnant, you know, on board ship and claim the right of pregnancy so that they're not hung, and after their uh, children are born, they are hung. Um, but there are wi female European pirates as well. Uh, not many of them, but a few. But we've had this throughout military history, right? Women who are hiding their gender, pretending they're men, and then fighting in armed conflicts. And the, the same thing since, tends to be true today with Southeast Asian piracy. They hide in the islands of Indonesia. Uh, there, it certainly, especially back towards the late 90s, early 2000s, when this was taking off, there's a lot of bribery. They just pay off the Indonesian officials. Because a lot of what goes on in Asian piracy today is essentially piracy for hire where some of these bigger, larger crime gangs would be like, you know what I need? I need a ship with this. And they'd get inside information and they'd pick their ship and then they'd pay everyone off. They'd have an inside man, they'd hire the pirates, they'd do all that stuff and then they'd go hide it in Indonesia for a while while they painted it, renamed it, and sailed it off somewhere else. So it still remains kind of the same thing today. And that's one of the things that the Asian, gr the Asian countries have been really working on is how do you patrol the Indonesian coastline? Because Indonesia, it's not a failed state like Somalia, but there are a lot of islands and it's not that rich. And so they've had a real problem fighting this bribery issue in, in Indonesia because it's very tempting if you're very, very poor to accept some money and look the other way. And so Japan and Singapore in particular have both been trying to kind of boost the, uh, the presence in Indonesia of Indonesian officials who aren't so bribable. But again, it's a, it's a big country with a lot of islands. And, and if any of you are interested, the wonderful book that I've used in the classroom that my students have loved is called Dangerous Waters. Oh, it's about a, a journalist who undertakes sort of this investigation of what's going on in Southeast Asia with respect to piracy and who he interviews and his own experiences and going aboard uh, cargo ships, for instance, or tankers, um, talking with Malay policemen who are trying to combat piracy, going into some of these communities. You know, these communities that I spoke of, these pirate havens, and, and one of them, of course, being Port Royal, which disappears in 1692. But take a snapshot of Port Royal, and I bet you you could superimpose it on Southeast Asia, the sort of pirate havens existing today, and you wouldn't find many differences. Um, and that's sort of the unique thing that we've talked about of this, this idea of piracy continuing through the ages. So Dangerous Waters, great, great read if you're interested in that sort of thing. Is there any credible information about whatever happened to Jean Lafitte? Um, no, not that I know of. Um, so the the mainstay book is Lyle Davis, uh, which is published in I think the fifties. We we looked at this uh, together, and and he just disappears really um, more than anything. Disappears off the scene. Whether he's in the bayou and passes away there, or whether he's gone off. I we just read I just read something and I told you about it, you know, that one author is asserting that he's Jewish. I've never heard that before. His which grandmother was, was Jewish. His grandmother was Jewish, you're right. So she's in according to Jewish law then he really right. is yes. not. Well, well because his mother is not. Oh, oh yeah. Right. So but it was a bit of a stretch there and we were kind of intrigued by that coming he from France. To Florida. He's a witness protector. <laughs> he's, in lot of, he's in a lot of places. <laughs> 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 But he has four national parks in Louisiana, so you should go visit. 
they, 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 Live on forever. <laughs> well, and of course, there was um, Speak Like a Pirate Day in September. Every September, you know, I have, I have students come in. Arr, you know, <laughs> and, uh, they want me to give extra credit for dressing like a pirate. You know. <laughs> I, I have to have a certain level of dignity. <laughs> I, I give extra credit for dressing like a pirate. <laughs> She knocks it down for me. Um, and then uh, there's a big festival in Galveston, I yes. believe, this year. So and there's one in Tampa as well, Gasparilla. Mm -hmm. I actually have one question. What would motivate someone to be a pirate? I mean, it's such a hard run. Why would they? I mean, besides, of course, money, but you could just not ever go rob, a, go rob a carriage or whatever. But what is it to, what is it, what's the romance, what's the, what's the reason? So I'll speak historically, you know, disaffected sons, sons who are never going to inherit because of primogeniture, right? The, fr only the fr first son, the eldest son, right. inherits everything. So they maybe have joined the Navy, the commission has been purchased for them, but the Navy back in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries is a very hard, disciplined place, and they, they don't like it, and so they turn, they go the opposite way and become a pirate. That's one reason. Um, I think sort of the idea of having your own fiefdom, so to speak, you know, having this onboard cohort of men, sometimes women, who are listening to you, responding to you, that's a bit of a power trip as well for them, if they can do it. So a lot of reasons, I think, primarily those who have turned from the Navy. It also tends to be a more democratic environment. Yeah. So if you're coming from like class conscious societies, either in the past or today, it's a way to get around those limitations. Yeah. Yeah. Before they went out on the voyage. Right. And um, in Somalia and in some other regions of the world, they tend to be children. Like there's a lot of teenagers, 15, 16 year olds. Um, it's actually very hard to tell in Somalia how old the pirates are because of malnutrition. Everyone's very small. Um, but they do, they recruit teens because they know that they'll be treated nicer, more fairly if they are captured. And of course, you know, 15 year olds are not necessarily the best at making the appropriate decisions in any given situation. So you have a lot of that going on too. Yeah. Was, the, uh, was the universal punishment for piracy a death sentence or, <coughs> or was that it was. Much applied locally? Yes. Absolutely, it's because it just had to be wiped out. So it was, a, it was not a beheading for the English, but it was hanging. And hanging either in the contraption like you saw, and you would, if you um, sailed up the Thames, thanks. If you sailed up the Thames, you would see these gallows as you continue to approach London. And there was a specific example being shown by the Crown, by the government, that look at all the pirates that we've captured, and we're showing you what happens to piracy. So hanging was the traditional uh, way, not jail <laughs> yeah. at all. And uh, today it's just cheaper. I mean, think about the cost of, of a court case against one of these pirates, and we've seen it, like the one that we brought back after the Captain Phillips attack and, and some of that stuff. It's very, very expensive. It's very expensive to gather evidence. It's very expensive for trial, you put them in prison. If you shoot them, you don't have any of those costs. And, um, and, you, and I mean, it's unfortunate, but it's true. I mean, I think my favorite story is, um, and it's apocryphal, but I, I hope it's true, of a Russian naval vessel that, uh, it's, that caught some pirates in the act. And they literally put them on an inflatable lifeboat 200 miles from shore. They released them, they just let yeah. them go. And they said, good luck. <laughs> Godspeed. <laughs> and, who knows? I, I like to think of it as the modern version of walking the plank. You, know? <laughs> you put, put them on an inflatable lifeboat, you put them out in international waters, and you say, guess what? You're someone else's problem now. And uh, the Russians, you know what I mean? But yeah, it, it's very true that it's just it's cheaper and it's easier in some ways to, to shoot them, and it's perfectly legal. So, yeah. They did not shoot them, they just said, here you go. Goodbye. <laughs> exactly. Bon voyage. Anyway, well, gosh, we could probably go on and on. I thank you so much. This is really exciting and very interesting. And we want to have
much for being here, and we uh, hope to see you again. Yeah. That'd be great. Thank you. Can we get a picture with you? Where's our photographer? Right now. Can you take a picture? Fred? Alright. Uh, we have a second round of pizza if anybody's still hungry. We ran out of the first go, so if anybody wants to I can't bring it. Thank you. We like to have a newsletter. That's cool, so.